Agape passage comes from Mark chapter 1, verse 40. You can find it in your pew Bibles on page 1553. We're going to read the story of Jesus healing the man with leprosy, the paralytic, and the calling of Levi. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing, as a testimony to them. But instead, the, he, the man, went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And since they could not get to him, or since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? What's easier to say? To say to this perilous man, paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, Get up, take your mat and go home. He got up. He took his mat and he walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. And once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Today we're going to look at an aspect of Jesus through his healing ministry. He tells us it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And in these verses, we see Jesus healing not only the physical body, but more importantly, the soul as well. Each of these stories have plenty of meat on the bone to make an individual sermon on them, but today we're going to take a survey approach to the three stories. And we're going to see Jesus acting like God and talking like God because he is God. Mark's gospel is the action gospel. No details about the birth of Christ or his growing up. He jumps right into the account of Jesus' ministry. Now, the Greek word that can be translated into immediately or quickly or at once is used around 40, 
50 times in Mark's writing, characterizing the um, action-based account. My Bible says that um, John Mark was the author. He was a close associate of Peter, and he wrote the account as he heard Peter say it in his preaching and in conversation with Peter. And he was the same John Mark that went on the first missionary journey with uh, Paul and Barnabas, and he left them during the trip. Deserted them is what it says in my Bible. And afterwards, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark to accompany them on the second missionary journey, but Paul refused. So Barnabas and Mark went on their way, and Paul teamed up with Silas for that second journey. And that's the last we hear about Mark until the letters to Colossians or in Titus where it looks like that Mark and Paul have reconciled their differences. Our passages today cover healing, miraculous and spiritual, one public, one private, and one unseen to our eyes. These stories are also recorded in both Matthew and Luke's Gospels as well. Let's look at the first one. The first story focuses on a man with leprosy. I've been reading a book called In the Image of God by Dr. Paul Brand. And he was a British surgeon who devoted his life to caring for and studying the effects of leprosy in people in India. He also managed the only leper colony in the continental United States that's located near Baton Rouge. Leprosy is one of the oldest recorded diseases. It attacks the nerve cells, causing the affected person to lose their sense of touch. They could hold an ice cube for hours or a hot stove and they would not notice it because there's no sense of pain, no sense of anything. And the loss of feeling often leads to people losing limbs, hands, or feet because of unnoticed wounds. Or it also leads to disformed joints. And because nerve cells that facilitate blinking fail, people don't blink who have leprosy, and it leads to blindness. Old Testament law in Leviticus outlines what lepers had to do. They had to wear torn clothing unkempt hair, a covering over the bottom part of their face, and had to cry out, unclean, unclean, as they walked around to warn others. They had to live alone and in isolation, apart from touching, apart from normal human contact. Some famous stories in the Old Testament dealt with leprosy. Moses, when he was giving him the signs of the burning bush, he pulled out his hand, it was leprous. Miriam, when she and Aaron rebelled against Moses, had leprosy. And Naaman the warrior in the Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, who was trying to profit over Naaman's healings. So one can see that this disease affected the man emotionally, religiously, and socially. And he takes a risk coming to Jesus. He was supposed to avoid other people. He was an outcast, a pariah. But he's heard about Jesus. He's heard about the miracles. And there's Jesus. He gets on his knees, and he's broken in spirit. And even as he's confident that Jesus can heal him, he's wondering if he's willing to heal him, a leper, an outcast. He says, if you are willing. And Jesus surprises him with the response. Because people fled in the presence of lepers, but Jesus didn't. We read that he was filled with compassion. And Jesus touched the man. And for us today, that seems to run a huge risk of catching leprosy itself. And for Jews, Touching someone with leprosy meant being defiled or ceremonially unclean. But we're not, but we are talking about the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Be clean, he commands, and immediately, Mark writes, immediately the leprosy leaves him and he's cured. The healing is a testimony to Jesus' divine power because Jesus is acting 
like God. And he used touch, just like we said, he touched you. It's touch. The very thing that leprosy robs a person of. Then Jesus tells the man to do what the law required for the man's own good. Because by fulfilling the law, the man could be restored to his place in society and in religion. The inspections by the priests and the required sacrifices were evidence to the people that the cure was real. And Jesus respected the law. In fact, he said he came to fulfill the law. A couple weeks ago, how does doubled up and pay with a kidney stone in the emergency room of the hospital? I was in the state of art facility with all those hookups to electronic things, monitoring my pulse, my breathing, chimes going off all the time, um, summoning doctors and nurses, getting wheeled around in these power gurneys to CT scans and all that. But they couldn't heal me. And I'm not ungrateful for their help, believe me, but I'm just reflecting that while they could lessen my pain with drugs, no one could say, be healed. Not like Jesus could say in a dusty little village in the open. I think we can also infer that this miracle was not done in the vicinity of others, as the leper had to, could not be near healthy people. And Jesus said to him, don't tell anyone. Well, that wouldn't make sense if he was in a crowd of people. But in his joy, the person sang the praises of Jesus, so much so that Jesus could not enter a town any longer. And those who saw the man before and after, the priests who examined him according to the law, and the people who saw him make the sacrifices had to be amazed. It was the leper. And he was cured of leprosy. And the fame of Jesus and the miracle continued to grow by word of mouth. A few days later, Jesus is in Capernaum, in his standing room only. So many came to hear and see him, the miracle. Mark records the story of the paralyzed man, lured by his friends through the hole in the roof. And I'm sure they were disappointed to see the crowds, so that they loved their friends so much they thought of a plan that we would say it's outside of the box. Roofs back then were flat, mats of branches supported by beams, and the friends tear a hole in the roof, and they lower the man lying on a mat to Jesus. Imagine the spectacle, and this time there are many people around to witness, and Jesus says a curious thing to them, to him. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. Sure, not exactly what the man wanted to hear or was expecting to hear. I think he was hoping to hear, get up and walk. Not exactly what the friends were expecting to hear either, after all their effort. And certainly not what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were expecting. But Jesus knows that the paralyzed man has a bigger problem than his paralysis, as do we. It's sin. And not just the bad things we do. But we're infused with, or rather we're infected with sin, and that's our sinful nature. To rebel against God, to want to live without Him. It's my life, and I'll do what I want. That kind of an attitude. To hide from God as Adam and Eve did. That's the kind of sin I'm talking about. Jesus didn't just act like God, He talked like God. Son, your sins are forgiven. No one dares say anything like that. Who indeed can forgive sins but God? No mere human can. Immediately, as Mark records, immediately Jesus knew what the leaders were thinking and what they were thinking in their hearts. So he responds to them. They didn't say anything out loud. Another clue that he's divine. What's easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to heal the man? And Jesus knows it's equally impossible for men, yet both are equally possible for God. And then he directly says to them, so that you may know that I have an authority on earth to forgive sins, he turns to the paralyzed man and says, get up, take that mat and go home. And the man gets up in front of everyone and can walk. Luke says he gets up and he's praising God. And everyone's amazed. Again, 
Jesus not only talks like God, he acts like God because he is God. And people are moved to praising God. There are times when we experience miracles or surprises that just make us want to praise God, aren't there? There's nothing else we can do or say but praise God. It may be thinking about it, we may be filling our hearts with that sentiment, or even how are we saying it. I remember once a doctor who saw my wife on the mend after a serious issue. And I remember him spontaneously saying, praise God. And I thought the same thing. Praise God. There's nothing else left to say. In our third story, we see Jesus teaching large crowds who have come inside the lake. And walking along, he comes to the tax collector's booth. Now, tax collectors were the social outcasts, along with robbers, adulterers, and the like. They were branded as the sinners. Kind of like lepers, who were outcast because of diseases, the sinners were outcast because of what they did or who they were. Jesus called Levi, who we also know as Matthew, to follow him. Jesus calls, we respond. Our hearts are opened by the Holy Spirit to hear the call. Just like Lydia, or the 3,000 on Pentecost Sunday. You can read about those in Acts sometime. Jesus didn't ask Levi in a weak voice, uh, follow me maybe? No, he summoned them, follow me, in that imperative tone. And immediately, Mark writes, Levi got up and did it. The action gospel. Later on, Jesus had dinner with those who were identified as sinners at Levi's house. Mark recorded that many followed him. <coughs> Dinner, eating with someone is a sign of friendship or acceptance. Someone who wants to be with you. And it might have been a party or a feast or a gathering, but Levi's many friends are invited. Maybe they came to see Jesus. Maybe it was a free food, but they were there. The leaders complained to the disciples. Why does he why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? They hate the sinners. They have no compassion or pity on them. But if I had to pick one verse today as a text for this message, it would be the answer. It's the sick who need a doctor, not the healthy. The leaders were saturated in spiritual pride and self-righteousness. They had the mark at corner on who is good in heaven. It was them. And now Jesus is saying that he has come to heal those who are sick and gain them access to heaven just as they thought they had. Sinners in heaven? They believe they earned heaven by their self-righteous lifestyle. In Luke's account of this story, Jesus said, I haven't come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repent. Being right with God is not something we can do or earn on our own. It is something that God can do by His grace alone. And like the leper or the paralyzed man, Jesus has compassion for us. We are invited to enter the kingdom. And Jesus is telling us that sin is an illness, a spiritual condition that's just as real as leprosy or paralysis. And in sin is in each and every one of us. We're infected with sin. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive the sins of others. We're not going to be without sin in this lifetime. But under the healing power of Jesus and through the work of the Holy Spirit, in our lives, sin's grasp and stranglehold on us is lessened. The self-righteous person doesn't see the need for salvation, and so becomes a victim of sin's tenacious grasp on their souls. The self-righteous person doesn't see a need to repent, and so believes that a life is, and so lives a life believing everything's okay. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news, he says. The title, Friend of Sinners, is a clear indication 
of Jesus' acceptance of you, of me. And as an aside, if God is willing to befriend a sinner, whoever that person is, do we, as followers of Christ, have any business in thinking down on some other people? Like maybe those with a different background or race. Or maybe those not well off, as financially well off as we are, or educationally. Or maybe the refugee person fleeing from his or her birthplace for safety. Or maybe those with a different lifestyle. And the list can go on. We have to constantly check our self-righteous meter to make sure that we're not being like those teachers and the Pharisees. Because it's insidious how it can creep into our lives and how it can creep into our thinking. When we're feeling proud or above others, that's a warning sign. God doesn't call us to judge while we're here. We are to love, to love God and to love others. To share the good news with everyone so all can repent and be saved. If you knew a good doctor or a good product, wouldn't you share it with others if it comes up in conversation? Sure you would. To let others know that with God, through Christ, there is mercy to pardon the greatest of sinners. After all, he pardoned you, he pardoned me. Finally, the healing miracles are clear proof of Jesus' divine nature. John wrote that if all the miracles of Jesus were written down, there wouldn't be enough room for the books to be written. And so the examples we have are just relatively few, but they give us a clue to his power over the creation. The miracles of Jesus were personal. They were personal and unique for each person, just what the doctor ordered. There's no blanket healing over people or saying, be healed, go home. No, the healings were individual and compassionate. We don't read about Jesus scolding people. Just the opposite. He often said a word with the person, and those persons shared the stories. The compassionate Savior. One who knows what we struggle with in life. One who can identify with us. One who knows you, personally, as a person. What you're dealing with. What's on your heart. And the miracles haven't stopped happening. Maybe you've seen the miracles in changed lives of others. Or in yourself. Maybe you've seen relationships restored. Emotional or physical hurts healed. Enslaving addictions or bad habits cast aside. Those are just as real as the ones we read about in the Bible. Do you need a miracle in your life? Our response to the Savior's call must be personal as well. First, you must realize that you're sick in need of a doctor and honestly want to deal with the sin in your life. To want to repent, to be baptized, to be born again as a new creature in Christ, to put away those old things that hold you back and put on the hope in the new things. Because Jesus has the power to heal us. And he's willing to heal us. Someone wrote, life without Christ is a hopeless end. But with him, it is endless hope. The Savior calls, offering salvation through his miraculous healing power. The question is, how will you respond? Like the teachers of the rulers were steeped in their self-righteousness? Or like the leper, in praise? My hope is that we remember often, if not daily, to praise God for his healing mercy in our lives. And to share your story as a testimony. To share your healing story of the miracle in your life with others, to God's glory. Amen. Our Lord and God, you know our weaknesses and frailty. You lived among us, and you ushered in the kingdom of God. As we read, the blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are healed. 
The good news is being preached. Thanks be to God. Amen. Grace to you and give you peace.